Welcome to February, first Friday, 2024. And in typical Corentus fashion, we will start with a coherence moment. Alexander. Yeah, we'll make it uh, simple today. I would just have each of us um, take three deep breaths at your own pace. Don't be shy. And then just take a moment and close your eyes. And reflect on something you're grateful for. A person, place, or thing, or something in your life. Just let that feeling of gratitude embody you. Great way to start a session. Thank you, Janice. Great. Thank you. So we are all here because at one point in time, you've engaged with us over the years in one of these programs. And... Um, or we've invited you because we wish to engage with you and we've been taking team um, development seriously and have a passion for it. So that is why we are all here and gathered today. So absolutely thrilled to bring to you our thought leader for February, our first party thought leader, Tosca Bruno Van Fyfiken, an author, team development practitioner, coach, consultant, international NGO sector and other sectors as well. Uh, Tosca uh, worked on international development and civil society issues for 30 years in practice in academia as an author, speaker, and consultant, coach, and team coach. Her work focuses on leadership development, team coaching, change management, governance, and organizational culture. While her practitioner background mainly was grounded in international development sector, such as World Bank, UN, think tanks, and NGOs, her research, senior leadership development, as well as change management work has focused on cross-sectional NGO, nonprofit, and philanthropic organizations. She is the co-author of the book Between Power and Relevance, The Future of Transnational NGOs, and host of the podcast, NGO Soul and Strategy. Tosca is a core practitioner at the globally renowned team coaching company, Corentis and Regal. And with that, I bring you Tosca. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Janice. So um, I am going to um, set us up for a thought experiment. That's all I'm doing here. I do not have answers for the questions I'm going to ask you all. So I hope, just hope we can co-think this through a little bit. I also... And when I say this is, as you see on the slide here, um, I want to talk with you about how some of us see, particularly in the sphere of nonprofits and NGOs, but potentially also in the private sector and government sectors, that the grounds for organizational legitimacy have been shifting. And what does that imply for the team? And how can the team at the same time uh, affect uh, uh, the organization in the right direction? I want to give a shout out to Janice, who helped. She, first of all, she invited me to tick up, pick up one of the uh, chapters in the book um, that she just described. Um, this book, indeed, between power and irrelevance. I just want to emphasize that the word is irrelevance. Thank that, you. <laughs> that's very important. Exactly. Um, <laughs> and um, to pick up one of the chapters in the book um, uh, that is devoted to legitimacy and uh, develop this, uh, make that a proposition for the um, for this discussion. Um, so we're not going to go over, Janet's already uh, introduced me, so let's go to definitions. So obviously, um, I think for all of us here, legitimacy, and particularly when it comes to organizational legitimacy, is a socially constructed concept, meaning it's it's a concept uh, made up by people, and therefore it can also change up over time. It's not an absolute uh, concept, if you will. So legitimacy, as we argue in the book, 
is the uh, perception or assumption in society that certain types of organizations are desirable, proper, and appropriate to have in society. And of course, that thought lives within a system of norms, values, and beliefs. So again, socially constructed. So in the book, we are arguing at least for NGOs, for non-governmental organizations or non-profit organizations, that there has been a fairly profound shift in the basis for what makes for a legitimate nonprofit. Um, and so on the left, you'll see in this slide, I'm going to take a little time here to talk you through it. On the left, you see some traditional basis for legitimacy. And on the right, we see an emerging different basis for legitimacy. So let's go through them. The first one is principles. So it used to be that if a nonprofit was a principled organization and could take the moral high ground, if you will, that that was more important than having outcomes. It used to be the case that if nonprofits spoke on behalf of disadvantaged people or abused animals, for instance, or the environment, that that was, or, or speak for those constituencies, that that was okay and not um, less or uh, that amplifying the voices directly of communities and of disadvantaged populations was uh, not necessary. It used to be the case that the technical expertise that staff uh, of nonprofits have, that that is a, an acceptable form of power and that exhibiting that power in, for instance, negotiations in the World Bank, uh, for instance, or with governments was gave them power and that other forms of knowledge, such as the lived experience or direct community local knowledge was not as important. It used to be the case that if nonprofits were financially showed financial propriety, so if they didn't engage in fraud, right, or abuse of money, if they minimized overhead, that that was more important than whether that the funds were actually used in an impactful way. It used to be the case that nonprofits could be charities, by which I mean simply an intermediary between donor money, so individual donors or corporate donors or institutional government donors that intermediary between them and recipients, instead of those resources being channeled directly towards local organizations um, that consist of, for instance, poor people. It used to be the case that nonprofits um, were expected to show that they conform to the norms of do and expectations of donors, and that they would mimic those who were considered to be successful instead of responding uh, to real needs. So on the left, you see those used to be the, the various foundations for legitimacy. Now we see things are different. So on the right, these emerging uh, bases for legitimacy are that you now have to show that you, as a nonprofit, that you, you can demonstrate you, have, you produce actual outcomes and that they are cost-effective. So being principled is no longer enough. Now you have to show in your strategy that you're actually living up to the claim that many, particularly international nonprofits make, that they uh, promote long-term societal um, transformation in which the root causes, for instance, for poverty are addressed and the structures underlying discrimination and poverty are addressed, that you actually are able to do that. Um, now your leadership, can no longer just be um, um, about elite leadership, but it has to be community-based leadership. It has to be globally representative. It has to be diverse, right? And in the public campaigns of um, of these nonprofits, um, they it, the supporters need to be out in front and not the staff, the elite. Now, in terms of governance. NGOs and nonprofits need to not just be um, accountable to their donors and their uh, boards, but to a multitude of stakeholders. Yeah. Now they need to be transparent in proactively sharing information and also in participating, for instance, in the U uh, US context in data transparency platforms like Charity Navigator or GivingWell. You may well use some of those. And finally, 
nonprofits now are expected to be responsive to feedback from their clients, for instance, and they need to be listening to communities and supporters. So you see, this is a fairly pro a profound shift in the foundations for what makes organizational legitimacy. And one could argue that maybe for the private sector and government, some of these shifts are equally happening. So um, I'm not going to go through the next slide, but it's obvious that being perceived as an organization to be legitimate has a ton of benefits, right? So just um, focusing your attention on the ones on the left, the kind of the major headings, that it helps you with, um, with trust, it helps you access resources, Positive reputation means you can hire, you have the biggest pool of the best possible people to hire and uh, you will retain them more. You have as nonprofits at least more influence with government stakeholders or um, uh, the IMF, for instance, or large corporations if you try to influence them. And you definitely have more chance of being a long-term sustainable. So clear benefits. So then the question is, what's the role of the leadership team and therefore also team coaching in this, right? If these grounds for legitimacy indeed are shifting, um, leadership teams obviously have an important impact on the organization's culture and therefore on what behaviors, habits and practices are deemed desirable, proper and appropriate. So teams create those foundations for legitimacy and if legitimacy has to be renewed, teams can impact that, right? But it does mean they have to think through what does this mean for them? And if we then um, look at revisit the Corentis team wheel for a moment, and we see that the norms for the team are the foundation underlying all the other parts of the team wheel, so if the grounds for organizational legitimacy indeed are shifting, how do teams then need to show up? What are the implications for their norms, their values and belief systems? So this is a kind of a, a question, a curiosity I had and wanted to explore with you. As I said um, in, um, in the beginning, um, and this is just a refresher of what we are shifting to as, as normative uh, foundations, if you will, for legitimacy. But I don't have an answer for this. Um, I honestly didn't. That's not how I came into the session. I am asking the question. And the question that I'd love for all of us to grapple with in this session is, what do these shifts in legitimacy expectations mean for a team? And that's where I would like it to leave. Maybe, uh, Janice, if we can go back to that last slide with the, the newer um, types of, yes, that one. Um, maybe we can open a discussion here. Uh, Janice, I'm handing it back to you for moderation and see what does the group think? What do these new bases for legitimacy mean for how the team has to show up? And what does it mean for us as team coaches? Well, why, uh, Tosca, why, and first of all, that was excellent, but why didn't you ask us a hard question? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, be hard, easy or hard for some people. So no, that's, that's, what, that's why we're having this conversation. This is a tough one. It's a tough one. No, and oh, I, it is a tough one. one. Who do you think it is? My gut says it's, it's, it's obvious. You know, when the world shifts and the expectations of an organization from the system shifts, the team, the leadership team, and every other team in that organization needs to shift as well. Who would like to comment, share, share your insights? So Tosca, thank you. I find this really compelling and I just love your style and just the, just the way that you present your material. And the first thought that comes to mind for me is especially around the transparency piece mm -hmm. it's around psychological safety interesting yes right a real need to embed trust psychological safety and respect in the very fabric of how the team is relating to each other mm -hmm. yes that makes sense um i also was thinking what do you think alexander but also everybody responsiveness 
So if, uh, for instance, responsiveness to feedback, both within the team, but also from the, uh, the, the neighboring teams, if you will. There's a couple things in the chat I can That's add true. to the, to the list. So Kate says, keeping norms, values, and belief top of mind and referring to them often. Mm -hmm. And then Jen says, this makes me think about a team building accountability and getting results and then amplifying transparency and each part of the team wheel to achieving purpose and results. And again, I'm not here to necessarily, it doesn't have to be, let's, let's all respond to each other's um, yeah. input, right? One of the conversations we had, Tosca, in preparation for this, which I thought was fascinating, is the, you know, the people in the organization are also the system. The system is also the people in the organization. So these shifts, these societal shifts, are going alongside or, or, or with and because of the people in the organization. It just depends on... I think where they are in that innovation adoption curve, where they are in that adoption curve of, are they on the leading edge of adopting these new legitimate, what makes an organization legitimate, or are they more on the laggard side? And we're finding that the organizations, it's certainly on the, on the private side, are more successful if they can shift more quickly to societal norms of legitimacy. So I was wondering, um... You know, we know that uh, younger generation employees, for instance, right, they are more interested in, for instance, when you look at the leadership bullet here, they're more interested in shared leadership models, right? Um, you see, for instance, in the NGO community within that, you see a, now a pull towards feminist leadership uh, models, whatever one may think of those, but it's a demand or almost an expectation, right, that there is... Um, a lot of involvement in decision making, including from people who are less experienced than those uh, um, uh, who have been in the company or organization longer time. There is more of an expectation around radical transparency, right, in organizations from employees within. So I think that teams also have to respond to those shifts in employee expectations. The same with ESG, for instance. So that was another thought I had. I would comment that the first one on the top, effectiveness, demonstrable cost-effective goal attainment mm -hmm. is versus the old way is an absolutely major shift in mindset for an NGO, or if this happened in a nonprofit, they've already got that, but but if, if they didn't, it's a huge change. And we, we've yes. seen this, Tosca, as you know, in some of the work that we're doing with some of of the Revolve's clients. Um, but I, I think that's one of the biggest ones. It um, is. Yes. So, so the expectation that, um, that it's no longer good enough that we intend to do good or that we are do-gooders full stop, that doesn't matter. In fact, there's a fair amount of frowning upon do-gooding also from the perspective of kind of white savior um, models, et cetera but that there is now an expectation that you actually have to show your outcomes. It, yeah. You're right, Mike. I think this is the biggest of all of them, I would say, from a mindset perspective. Since it's a big jump from a mindset perspective, it also probably implies from an implementation perspective, it's a huge jump. Yeah. Yeah. Tosca, we've got a number of people joining in in the chat. And folks, if you'd like to speak please raise your hand and come off mute. Um, if I work backwards, um, I'll just say, Melanie, would you like to build on what you said here about balance of mission and margins? I think it speaks to what you guys are already talking about with that <clears throat> shift in mindset and you know, mission is no longer enough and nor is margins or making money in the nonprofit really a dirty word. You know, it's about viability, sustainability, and in order to meet the meet the mission, you have to have a healthy foundation within your human system, organization, business, whatever you call it. So that's where my head was going. That's Thank really you. interesting, uh, Melanie. You thought about it from that you came in it from the opposite direction. I was coming in, and you're absolutely right. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I just think that 
when you do the comparison, I think it's it's also some of the leadership team dynamics are less kind of reporting on the same old, same old. It's who needs to be at the table and how can you get that information palatable and actionable around effectiveness or responsiveness. It, it brings data to the table and they don't always want to read it or mm -hmm. engage with it. So it's new seats. I think it touches on the generations and it's also leaning into how to facilitate that. I think. Mm -hmm. I see Gary for it. working in a similar vein. Gary, would you like to join in? Yeah, sure. So, so many times when I read messages that go out, especially external ones, they're really the ones for internal teams. They're focused on metrics or numbers or things. And if you ask yourself the question of, so what, or what's the impact, that isn't conveyed very clearly. So people don't get the sense that you really are effective. It isn't written in such a way that conveys things or gives a person an opportunity to follow a link if they want to get more information and more detail. So I think we have to be a lot better at crafting these kinds of messages that demonstrate effectiveness and don't be so focused on publishing numbers that actually people often fairly off put by. Mm. You're thinking particularly, Gary, about the supporters of, of organizations, correct? Yeah, or sometimes we also need just public support. We need awareness for the effort that's going on. And if yeah. it's written in these very general and statistical kind of ways, they don't have an impact many times. Mm. Uh, so finding a better way to craft the message is important for many purposes. Mm. Both for effectiveness and for um, transparency as well, possibly. Yeah. possibly. Mm. Grace, would you like to share about your thinking here? I wrestle with this leadership again in a nonprofit sector. And I, last night I had a conversation with another team and on this exact um, the issue, we say that we value community, we say we value each team, but putting that into practice is uh, such a far long way to go. I think there's fundamental changes of our even the the view of humanity of theology has to change it, that reminds me of the thinking path so the thinking path and we in that alexander put out a number of years ago where the thinking needs to change the base thought habits we have and hold needs to actually change before the feelings can change, before the actions can change, before the results can change. The fundamental thinking shifts that are critical to anything else, any other shifts occurring. There's always the question though, does thinking come first or does action come first or signals come first, right? We humans tend to think that we need to think our way through to a new um, reality, for instance, but actually our actions are often provoked even before we have thought about them. Um, I was wondering, Peter, do you want to speak more? You said the crucial role as a team leader in helping the team transition or get out of the way. I'm just thinking through an experience with four formerly independent entities coming together to work together with a, with a team leader, having a vision of uh, high reliability for the organization. It's a healthcare organization. And it basically go goes against the grain of the culture of at least two of the four entities the leaders were ref the leadership meetings were reflecting that conflict um and the role of the leader is so so critical in this type of situation um where and it, it's got to do with the effectiveness piece um but also the having that <clears throat> the sensitivity and ability to move an organization, a, a group, a, a group or a team forward, or to be able to step back and, you know, and be able to focus or support those that maybe have uh, a better way of doing things. And it, it gets into the role of the uh, coach, facilitator, consultant too. Uh, so that's, that's what's going through my head. Hmm. Yes, Peter, that underscores the the importance of our work, of all our work, yes. you know, what we do to support leaders and teams, because they need support. Exactly. Yeah. And um, 
Mary Bessa, to Gary's point, I think it's also making time for the team to digest the, the data, the information, to to agree and how, on how to make it actionable, how to own and align with strategic and mission progress. Arriving at a narrative together is a new form of team engagement and communication. Yeah. What do you all think about the governance bullet on this slide? So if because that's the case for companies too, right? Companies are no longer supposed to be accountable to their shareholders and to their boards, but to society in some fashion or the other, at least the, the more the larger companies mm. feel that way. So what does that mean compared to the past for how a team has to show up in terms of its habits, practices, behaviors, and the underlying belief systems? And this is where I was, where I added before, the organizations which don't have such solid belief systems of the more traditionalist way of working are succeeding on the private side, they're succeeding on the local state and government side and they're succeeding on the NGO side because they're not stuck in those, those mental thought habits that are keeping them from shifting to multi-directional accountability, you know, sh shifting to a different type of leadership where you actually have to be community and supporter driven as opposed to, you know, you're the grandson of somebody kind of thing. So. Janice, what you're saying to me underlines the Tosca, including the norms underpinning the team wheel. Um, and Melanie, your comment about beliefs, these are all examples. Norms, thinking, beliefs are all examples of thinking in the thinking path and aligning and making visible new thinking that includes not just an internal facing norm, but also really explicit external facing norms that are different than the stakeholders that people chose before, and how that information is brought back, digested, and processed by the team. Yeah, exactly. I think that was well said, Julie, that it's it, also the external norms. I do, and I know NGOs struggle with this, the more stakeholders there are externally to the organization as reflected in what we have here under leadership and governance, for instance, and also transparency, right? radical transparency about mistakes, for instance, uh, that organizations have made, um, it leads to a hell of a lot of stakeholders and the possibility that some have conflicting expectations of the organization, directly conflicting, and how to then make choices around that. Do you all thoughts about that sometimes i know for and for nonprofits that's always been a reality that it's um multi-stakeholder accountability but more so now but how about for corporations for instance yeah ab absolutely i think the, the big shift over the past i would say 30 years with some people more recently from being just shareholder focused driven to stakeholder all stakeholder driven is a is a big shift and realizing that one of those big stakeholders is the planet. Yeah. So that's a big mental shift that is um, that is going on. And, the, and then again, the successful companies are the ones who are fully embracing that on a commercial private end. And, um, you know, one of our clients was just thinking, you know, is really want to do so much better in a particular sector that has harmed the environment in so many ways. Mm -hmm. And they're one of the leading companies because they want to do great by all their stakeholders and their shareholders are winning because of it. Yeah. And they are, by the way, then they are becoming more competitive in terms of the employee attraction and retainment, right? Because it's, it has become more important what uh, the mission, how the mission impacts the planet. Exactly. Any other thoughts? I have a thought to share with you, Tosca. It's sort of a multi-layered piece of thinking, but I think on your last piece here, it has also a lot to do with power dynamics. Yeah. And, you know, in our recent podcast, I shared with you how I was surprised when I began working with the sector that it was as or more hierarchical than the commercial organizations I had been working in. Mm -hmm. And then I noticed using our operating modes 
framework or model that many of the teams were leader directed command and control or working groups and that power was not shared. That team leaders operated from a sense of command and control, power driven, top down, and there was no real trust, or maybe it's not, that's not the right word, but there was no real faith at a fundamental level to have teams operating at a leader member mode where leadership was shared and leaders were first among equals. So for me, I think it begins there, that if you have team leaders and leaders who really operate from a leader member perspective are sharing power, are first among equals with their teams, are distributing accountability within their teams for shared goals, for collective work products, and that starts to filter outwards towards other stakeholders. How, how does that last thing happen, Alexander? When you said, and that then filters outwards. I'm curious in, uh, in that bridge uh, and how to visualize that. I'm not exactly sure how it filters out technically, but I know there's one organization I'm working with right now that demonstrates that particular form of leadership and the team itself is becoming a high performing team and their interactions with their beneficiaries and their interactions with their stakeholder partners is shifting as well because the people in the organization feel more empowered and more accountable and they're dealing with them in a different manner and is it is the mechanism the pathway modeling plus out of things i'm guessing i would say so Absolutely. Yeah. Was it David Brooks who said, um, find a new way to live, live it, and others will follow, or something like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you've made a number of comments today. Is there a place you've landed you'd like to share? I'm getting so much more from everyone else's comments, but I will share the thing that I think I'm walking away with is this is something I've been thinking about more broadly in our society is that now there's an opportunity for leaders to be more clear and brave about declaring a path mm -hmm. and declaring new mindsets and values. And that I think more and more, and you're helping me with this, Tosca, the leader's role is to help, is to use their leadership skills to help listen to inform their paths and then to influence others to follow. To inf so I think about these shifts and norms. I think about when I was working um, in DC at the Capital Area Food Bank and the competing demands that we had between our funders um, and understanding our the people that we served. Unfortunately, our funders like Marriott Corporation, I can't say enough nice things about them, were already very aligned and and educated about the needs of the community. But I think about how influential the leader of the Capital Area Food Bank was and how much work she did helping other funders understand our community's priorities. I just think that, I think that it's our role as coaches and as team coaches to help our leaders um, be empowered as better listeners and better influencers. Those are the things I'm thinking about. Both better listeners and better influencers, right? Yeah, and we know that influencing and persuasion comes first from a, a lot of listening. That's interesting. Thanks, Jen. We have time for one last question, and Gary, that's to you, my friend. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm looking at this slide, and most of my work is with people in the private sector, but you could actually take the same structure and you could apply it. When you look at 23% of employees trust their leadership, and you look at engagement rates below 40 percent and so forth these are really very very similar they just would need to be rephrased uh, slightly so very helpful to hear this discussion today well thank you tosca so much for being our thought leader for february first friday we're so happy that you are with us and we've all um on behalf of all of us we've gained so much for you being here and that we can give a round of applause for Tosca. Thank you. And with that, and the way we do this is, please write this down. One, 
you get a free chapter in Tosca's book, and that's um, a favorite book of mine. So Between Power and Re Relevance, The Future of Transnational NGOs. And I was reading it through the lens of private sector. And very like page after page, I'm like, yep, same with you, Gary. It's like, yep, same, you know, the same shifts and mm -hmm. the same great insights across all sectors. Nobody has ever told us that. Yeah, love it. So please write this down, go get your free chapter. I will have Alexander take us out to with a mindfulness moment to transition us back to where we came from. Okay, so thank you, Tosca. That was very insightful. Um, as we always do, I would have you just close your eyes and engage in a moment of reflection and ask yourself two questions. The first is, given this session, what did you learn today? What did you learn that was new? That was an insight or an aha? And what are you walking away with? You open your eyes, feel free to jot one or two things down. And with that, Janice, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you. So again, thank you, Tosca. Thank you, everybody, for joining us um, for our 45-minute fun first Friday with the Thought Leader. We will see you all next month. And anyone who wants to reach out, feel free to do so in between now and then. We'd love to hear from you.